the Jaipur bookmark reflects the core values of the publishing industry. And it brings together some of the greatest publishing professionals from around the world. Jaipur Bookmark is a platform where you get an opportunity to understand business. So I think JBM is something which is fantastic and people who don't know about it should come and make it and make it a part of it. Jaipur Bookmark, come and celebrate literature, meet authors, agents, publishers. Join us at the Jaipur Bookmark. Uh, during COVID when we're all sitting at home it's it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together it certainly brightens up my evening in pandemic we are digitally the literature festival and I think that our show is not in front of us we are talking about it but we can feel that feeling that we are connected to thousands of people who are connected to us who are listening to us and who are listening to us and who are listening to us 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 to view and listen to our incredible speakers from across the world, we were able to continue in our tradition of ensuring the free flow of knowledge and information. On behalf of our, of our festival directors, advisors and my colleagues at Team Book Arts, we welcome you all to the second Festival Directors Roundtable of 2021. Jaipur Bookmark is an important B2B segment aimed at developing and nurturing the business of books and literaries and art festivals across the world. JBM has hosted a Festival Directors Roundtable every year for the past four years, where festival directors from around the world exchange ideas on how festivals continue to forefront the fight for freedom of expression and ideas. They share their stories, challenges and learnings in the fight to protect this much needed space. Over 100 festival directors from around 27 countries have been a part of the Festival Directors Roundtable in the past years. This year, the digital medium has offered us the opportunity of hosting the entire series around that. We present today, Unbox the Festival. Anna Philomena Amaral, Kanak Reza Chauhan, Natasha Jinwala, Nilofar Billy Moria, Sham Parekh in conversation with Sanjoy K. Roy. Anna Philomena Amaral is a Portuguese awarded writer and an experienced translator in several languages, particularly German. She has already published nine novels in Portugal, Mexico, and the USA. With Walted Homes, Those Who Cheated Death, she won the prize of the Los Angeles Book Review. She participated in several literary festivals in Cape Verde, India, Brazil, and Beijing. She is the director of the literary festival in Portugal, Words of Fire. Next speaker, Kanak Rekha Chauhan. She is the founder director for Metaphor, the Lucknow Literature Festival and Kanpur Literature Festival. She is also the president of Wiki, Women's Indian Chamber for Commerce and Industry Arts Leadership, UP Chapter, and the co-convener at INTAC, Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural and Heritage, UP Chapter. She was Penguin Ambassador for Lucknow in 2011. Penguin Publications completed 25 years in India, and 25 ambassadors were named in 25 Indian cities following a story writing contest. She's a chemistry postgraduate and management studies diploma holder from Mumbai University. Kanak is also a published author, having written articles and poetry in various magazines and newspapers, and has been awarded several times by numerous organizations, including Pride of Uttar Pradesh, by the governor for contribution to the revival of literature and culture in the city and the state. Our next speaker, Natasha Jinwala. Natasha is a curator, writer, and editor based in Colombo and Berlin. Jinwala is Associate Curator at Gropius Bo, Berlin, Artistic Director of Columboscope Festival in Sri Lanka, and the 13th Guangzhou Biennale. She has curated numerous exhibitions and biennales around the world over the past decade. Jinwala writes regularly on contemporary art and visual culture. Recent co-edit volumes include Stronger Than Bone and Knights of the Dispossessed Riots Unbound. 
Nilafar Bilamuria, the founder director of the Kunshwan Singh Literary Festival in Kasoli and London. The festival began as a labor of love to propagate the values and ideals of Kunshwan Singh, which are needed in today's world of strife and lives, full of care, where we have no time to stand and stare. A background with a leading international hotel chain and the largest selling English uh, daily newspaper in the world prepares her to take on this challenge of bringing together leading minds on a common platform to inspire, challenge, learn and unlearn. Our next speaker, Sham Parikh, started his career reporting for the Times of India for over a decade and then worked as a senior editor in DNA Mumbai during its launch. Eventually, he launched DNA in Gujarat and headed it for over a decade. Learning the art of building teams, training people and designing and redesigning newspapers in the due course, he decided to train finer journalists and communicators to help Indian journalists take and other content sell globally. He also co-founded Gujarat's largest and most popular latest, Gujarat Literature Festival. Sham currently heads the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Aura University, Surat, which he has set up and advises other universities on their media education syllabi. He also works as director of Ahmedabad's oldest journalism and management institute, Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan's HB Institute of Communication and Management. In conversation with Sanjay K. Roy. Sanjay is an entrepreneur of the arts and the managing director of Team Bukats, producers of the Jaipur Literature Festival and JLF and 25 other festivals across the world. He's a founder trustee of Salam Balak Trust, providing support services for street and working children in Delhi. Roy works closely with various industry bodies and the government on policy issues in the cultural sector in India and has lectured and collaborated with various international universities. All these virtual roundtables will be available to view on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. But before we move on to our next uh, to the session, may I please introduce and invite festival co-director Namita Gokhale to say a few words. Namita Dear friends of literature, author of 11 works of fiction and has written extensively on myths as well as the Himalayan region. Her acclaimed debut novel, Paro, Dreams of Passion, was published in 1984. A recent Jaipur Journals, published in 2020, was set against the backdrop of the vibrant Jaipur Literature Festival. Betrayed by Hope, a play on life of Mat Michael Madhusudan Dath, was also published in 2020. The forthcoming novel, The Blind Matriarch, is her 20th book. Co-founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literature Festival, Gokhale is committed to supporting translations and curating literary dialogues across languages and cultures. She was conferred the prestigious Centenary National Award for Literature by Assam Sahitya Sabha in 2017 and has won various other literary awards. Namita, over to you. Dear friends of literature, it's an honor and a privilege to welcome all of you festival wallers from places far and near to discuss the challenges and the learnings of the last year. Literature is an anchor and a compass, and literature festivals hold together the community of writers and readers. They make books and ideas accessible across cultures and continents. The Jaipur Bookmark and Festival Directors Roundtable reach out to seek and share our conjoined experiences our observations, our intuitions, our strategies and hard-learned lessons at this moment of enormous change and accelerated new opportunities. I look forward to listening in and learning from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much and a pleasure to have uh, Anna Kanak Natasha and Nilifar and Sham on our uh, director's fortnight panel. Welcome, welcome to the Jaipur Big Mark. And I look forward to listening to all of the many challenges that you each of you have faced in your countries, in your festivals, and perhaps innovative solutions that may, uh, you may have come up with, which will help other festival directors try and work in these very difficult times. When the pandemic hit in 2020, um, or rather in 2019 in China, I think most of us across the world were absolutely oblivious to the fact that it may travel outside of Wuhan. I remember being on a, in the underground in London in March of 2020, saying to my colleague, uh, Linda, uh, saying that what would ever happen if COVID 19 came to the UK and how would you know transport change and how would our festivals change from there I went on to Morocco which is where we were planning 
a new festival and I'd gone to the press conference and I roughly said the same thing. What would happen to the famed Moroccan markets uh, should the pandemic ever get to Morocco? All of us got home literally screeching back uh, early March. And even as we started understanding that the pandemic had now moved out from China and crossed the borders like most pandemics do, they don't believe in visa restrictions. Uh, they don't necessarily subscribe to curfew orders. And they certainly don't listen to uh, any government saying only 50 people or 20 people or 100 people. A pandemic or uh, a virus does what a virus does best. It doesn't have a central headquarter. It multiplies. It, it is completely disseminates across the population, across countries. And that changed all our lives, especially in the festival, in the creative and cultural world. It has decimated millions of artists and artisans world over. And even while writers have continued to write and make sense of these difficult times, not enough people have continued to buy books uh, or visit bookstores or go to their local neighborhood uh, gallery. As a result of which, it's not just the musician or the theater artist or the writer who's impacted, but it's all of those others, the invisibles, as we call it. It's the people uh, in, at backstage. It's the lighting designers, it's the costume designers, it's the tailors, it's the dressers, it's the ironing person, it's the people front stage, it's the people backstage, it's the people who clean your toilets. All of these people... And the last survey was that you need 33 people to be able to get one person onto stage. All of these people have been impacted and uh, opportunities closed down. And even while the digital world opened up, allowing many uh, to be able to put out their wares, and products and shows digitally, what it did was create a second divide. Earlier, as we know, there's been a divide of language. Today, there's a divide of bandwidth. Those who have bandwidth and those who don't. It is in this scenario, even as we are opening up the world over and people are protesting from Paris to Washington and other parts of the world, are saying that they don't want to mask up. They don't want to take the vaccination. Are we hosting this discussion? I'm going to start with Anna. Anna, in Portugal, if you tell us how you've been able to deal with the pandemic, how your festival has been able to transform itself or meet the challenge of today. And I'll go around the table. I'm in a place which has got terrible bandwidth. This is our home in, in Goa, second home in Goa. Uh, so if I do drop off, Suraj will pop back up and he'll ask you, a couple of questions till I log back on. But Anna, tell us, tell us about Portugal, tell us what's happening, tell us about how you dealt with the situation in your festival uh, at this point. Uh, thank you, Sanjoy. Uh, as you know, so Portugal is a very small country compared with India, and uh, our main um, cities were really very, very badly. Uh, they suffered very, very badly with the pandemic. But uh, our festival is in the middle of the country, but in the interior. So, and uh, where we are underpopulated. So we didn't have so many problems with the pandemic. Therefore, our festival didn't stop. Or we, we have done the, the last fourth um, uh, edition uh, with, uh, with public. We... We have uh, every time uh, done all the events with the public because we don't. We are not a mass festival, so we are a festival for uh, maybe hundreds of people, and so we we could and we we heard the message of our uh, president in 2020 when he was saying that the country mustn't stop. So we have to stop the pandemic, but not the country. So, and we, we uh, interiorized this sentence and decided to uh, uh, really uh, 
go forward with our uh, with our festival in uh, uh, almost 10 places 10 countries at the same time for four days and uh, everything went well but as you know uh, the um, all the trips were cancelled and we couldn't invite anyone from outside but now we are we are uh, fighting against another thing now we are opening everything, all the borders and the uh, travels and, uh, and so on. So we can now invite people from other countries to come here. But uh, our festival had, right from the beginning, a very important um, priority. And the priority was the climate. And so now we are dealing with a problem. How can we bring the people from outside the country by plane, when planes pollute so much. And uh, this is now our dilemma. We don't know how to do it. So we are now next, in the next edition, we are um, innovating in a thing that is called Words of Fire on the Rail. So we are going to uh, take our festival through the country and traveling only by train. As you all know, the train is the most uh, ecological uh, transport, uh, mean of transport that we can use. So we are going, and it's very interesting because in September, we had already the idea in August and we disseminated, but in, in, uh, uh, in next September, the European Union is going to have what they call the Connection Europe Express, and they are going to go around Europe only by train. And they start here in Lisbon on 2nd September. And there we are going to present our idea for, for our festival uh, going only through Portugal. But if this, um, uh, let's say, this experience goes well, maybe we'll do it with the festival around Europe. And... Um, this is uh, something that is a challenge for us, but it's a way to show that um, even from since 70, 70, the 70s, that we are, uh, this pattern of growth is completely unsustainable. So we have to change our paradigm. We have to change our way of living. We have to change our way of doing culture. And if I write something, I can't do the opposite. I can't say the opposite. And here, maybe my words are a little bit uh, uh, politically incorrect, but I have to say you, because we are in a, in a very important forum, in one of the biggest uh, festivals in the world, Jaipur Festival. And I think that Maybe here in this round table, we could do or we could um, maybe start a movement, uh, something called uh, uh, literature for the planet or something to unify all the festivals in this struggle against what everything is killing the planet. But it's not killing the planet. It's... Uh, um, augmenting the abyss between uh, rich and poor. It's augmenting the, pover the po poverty. It's augmenting the inequality. It's augmenting all this um, wild business that uh, wants to make money and profit at all costs. So I think that culture and particularly literature could give or could be an example of a new utopia, of a new paradigm for the future. Because time is really running out and everyone knows that. For instance, in India, you are having so many natural catastrophes. In China, in Europe. So we are seeing things that we can no longer close our eyes and look in the opposite way. So, and everyone, every one of us must, must do their duty. And you as one of the most important literary festivals in the world, 
could be an example and start this movement with a manifest that could come out from this round table. Sorry, when I start to speak, I speak always too much. Uh, fantastic. I think Anna has summed up the entire discussion and laid the, in many ways, the root for us, our conversation. Ganat, let me come to you. Anna talked about inequality. She talked about uh, uh, trying to save the planet, all the pollution. Uh, Kanak, you come from the most populous state in India, which perhaps was the most devastated by the pandemic. You also come from a city which is very industrialized um, and uh, in many ways it's sort of the beating heart of the industry in uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, in, in, which is of course in the north of India. Tell us how have you been able to address some of these challenges that you've come across and what Anna said, is there a way or is there a possibility? She says, can we have a festival of literature for the planet uh, where all of us don't have, we don't need to necessarily fly people in, but we can do something collectively, each city connecting with the other. Kanana. Yeah, thanks, Sanjay. Um, well, coming to uh, the city of Lucknow, it is also not just the most populous city, it is also the city that gave India progressive writers movement, which I think is the greatest and the most respectable congregation of writers. Um, uh, coming to uh, digital festivals, when we realized sometime in 2020 that it's going to be uh, digital now and not a physical one, mine was the loudest hurrah because um, it turned out to be much environment friendly. Even though we say that uh, it's just the next best thing, it's not, it can only be a replacement um, compared to an uh, in person physical festival. Yet it turned out to be the most green festival, the environment festival. We, did, we had to do away with all the branding and paperwork, etc. Also, our data was more organized as virtual events. They have allowed us to rethink how we can digitize the content, how we can, uh, and we generate so much from our sessions. So it is now available on demand to one and all. It's also cheaper. Um, well, as you know, that um, our festival is very much dependent on the government, the state government. Um, we have to be very careful about the funds and that is our, that's something uh, topmost on our minds when we are curating a festival. It heavily leans on the state government because there is a minuscule a corporate presence. It's not, it's actually 10 years ago, it used to be a zero industry city. So uh, it's based mostly bureaucracy and uh, some chicken curry and food industry to look like, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I should be saying it now, the transfer industry in the state seems to be the most uh, uh, beneficial one. But um, doing a digital festival, um, it has been um, easier for me. So we could get a lot of people who otherwise could not have attended the festival. We have uh, a better attendee pool. Uh, for instance, people like uh, the Maestro Pandit Haripasat Charasya, he could not have ended because of his age and other factors. And he could also join us when we organized our spring festival in March. We generally have a three-day festival uh, in a year, but we could have another one in March as well because it was a digital festival. The only thing I miss out is that feel, that, that organic, physical in-person feel and I miss out my fangirl moments too. Coming to Anna's um, uh, suggestion, I think it's a great idea. And uh, as I see for another year or so, as per the WHO um, advisory, we, are, uh, we have to stick to digital festivals. So why not? I mean, the world becomes very small when it comes to virtual festivals. So we need to work out the strategy how how we do that and what she's saying we have seen so many climate changes in the last six months it's flooding somewhere and we have forest fires somewhere so what she talks about environment what she's speaking about inequality i think those are the issues we need to deal with and literature 
has always helped um, make this place better. So why not? Th thank you, Kanak. As you said, why not? I think that's the most important thing. Nila, for coming to you, you sort of traversed uh, every place from uh, Kasoli to through to London with the Kushwan Singh Literature Festival. And in both these places, how have you been able to manage to tackle uh, the fundamental issue of relooking at the way that you actually do a festival? You're on mute, Nilipa. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, like everybody else, uh, we had to go digital. And, uh, but we thought it important to continue with the festival because, uh, um, you know, it's uh, important to have your voice heard. And uh, we always believe that we're a festival with a purpose. And uh, therefore, um, uh, going digital in many ways uh, has uh, worked out uh, uh, well for us in the sense that Kanak said, you know, we're a very tiny festival. We don't have uh, uh, big sponsors. So uh, cost-wise, uh, it has certainly helped in cutting down costs and getting uh, speakers that we may not have otherwise um, got to the festival. But yes, um, uh, I think most of our audience miss the, uh, you know, the look and feel of a live festival because Kasoli is a wonderful destination and uh, half the joy of a festival is just uh, being in Kasoli, meeting people. It's a place that uh, speakers love going to because uh, they have a chance to interact with their audience. You know, everybody mingle together. Um, so... Uh, uh, these are some of the uh, advantages of a digital. Um, um, Anna uh, mentioned Festival for a Planet. It's right up our street, Anna, because, um, you know, we've always been dedicated to ecology and education of the girl child. So we've always had sessions around these themes and we also work um, in these areas. We provide scholarships to kids uh, in schools in, in Himachal, which is the state in which we do the uh, festival. We have, uh, we've worked with the government there. And we've had uh, uh, 10,000 kids participating in the joy of learning competitions that we do for the kids. And a lot of these competitions are, uh, centered around ecology because uh, uh, these were areas that were very close to Kushwan Singh. And uh, uh, Kushwan Singh was, um, uh, he was a writer, a journalist, but more important, I think he was an iconoclast. And uh, so it's his values that we uh, try to continue through our festivals uh, in Kasoli and London. So, yes. I'm in for the planet. Thank you, Nilofa. Natasha, Nilofa talked about festivals with a purpose. And Anna talked about how festivals can be one possible solution to some of the problems that we're facing and certainly address them through informed discussion and debate. Tell us, you know, how you've been able to manage that you've not only been working in Sri Lanka, you've also been working in Dubai and other parts of the world. Tell us how the pandemic impacted you and how you've been able to use that either to an advantage or to your disadvantage uh, in this last one and a half years. Thank you so much uh, for this invitation to be part of um, such an enriching um, and open uh, discussion brainstorm. I believe also that as a festival that is uh, run by a young and uh, small team, sometimes this element of intimacy and uh, shared learning is one strength. And uh, 
as you know, in Sri Lanka, there have been uh, festivals that have uh, really vibrantly led cultural community in the post-war uh, reality. Uh, and yet, you know, there is a, a whole lot of trauma and violence uh, that is still being unraveled and, and considered, uh, thought through in what has been witnessed by the cultural community in Sri Lanka at large. So as a festival model, you know, we have been really thinking also of practices of decentralization. So what does it mean to operate in a way that we are literally thinking about the festival as a space of uh, creative uh, kind of curriculum building or the festival uh, as a place of cultural exchange on a longer term, uh, which has led us to do production-based residencies. Uh, you know, our artists were brilliant. Uh, they came from Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, and also local artists from different parts of the island. Those who were coming into the country went to quarantine um, as part of the residency, you know. So it's, it's also the fact of how are we reformatting um, our creative labor and what are the ways to continue connecting uh, in a way that our networks continue to remain resilient? Uh, because that again, within the fractured realities of the subcontinent, we need to consider that very carefully. And Sri Lanka has been an important crossroad. Uh, so we are keen on uh, you know, building partnerships across the region. And when we talk about planetary uh, uh, role, we have, for instance, really been first looking to our left and right, you know, and really thinking about South Asia and Southeast Asia and involving uh, individual practitioners as well as organizations in our cultural network. Uh, this includes, for instance, Chobi Mela in Bangladesh, uh, where when we had our first postponement, four artist projects uh, curated by Anushka Rajendran, our festival curator, were shown in Bangladesh. So I think if we are not uh, also being possessive about premiering and launching projects uh, individually as a branded festival, then we can really look at this kind of experimental... Asham you know exactly what natasha was saying about you know how uh, in many ways festivals bring people together it looks at much of the uh, much of the issues that have happened locally in many ways sham yours is the youngest festival today it's a fairly new comparatively new festival so if you tell us again share with us how you manage this and you know one always looks at uh, gujarat with the horrors of the riots of so long ago. And are these some of the issues that you, like Natasha has been saying in Sri Lanka, been able to address? And does that sort of, is that one of the many purposes uh, perhaps that the festival can uh, address? Sure. Uh, thank you, Sanjoy, and the whole team for making this happen, for connecting us all from all places across the world. Uh, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, last year was a very bad year for everyone and everyone started experimenting with the digital mode quite early on, particularly in Gujarat, the literary and cultural circles got onto uh, several digital modes like the Zoom conferences, many of them got into virtual events and so on. Many people preferred a you know, pre-recorded one couple of uh, local OTT platforms were also launched. So even they uh, let into it. So we decided to set it out for the year. And we did not uh, hold even a digital event. We had some smaller events. Uh, one of the main reason is we felt that there are three uh, ingredients that go into uh, making our festival click. I mean, uh, who am I talking to? You know it better. But the venue and the, uh, the possibility of interaction, the live interaction with people is one of the major draws. And without that, we felt that no matter how great curation and content we bring, it may not work as well. Uh, also, we realized that a lot of people were able to afford and create their own small digital events. And that was a good substitute for income for many of the artists and writers and performers. And we thought it was doing well and the place was already quite crowded right from the word go, you know, right from April onwards, there were events happening. 
So uh, this year we are planning clearly a, an event in December. Hopefully the third wave should end uh, before that. If not, then January we are open to exploring event in both the months. If not, then we will be creating a digital event. But uh, coming back to the points that Anna and Natasha talked about, I think both the points are worth exploring. And uh, even in Jaipur, in the earlier rounds, uh, you also proposed uh, uh, some of these ideas. Uh, like, you know, if, uh, like Natasha says, that in case if everybody can travel, if the ideas and uh, people can connect, if the cities can connect, if the festivals can connect, I think that synergy will work very well, at least in the digital space. And every event will have some value and something interesting and a differentiator while ensuring that everybody's identity and curation stays intact. Uh, as far as the subject of environmental issues and uh, the green aspect is concerned, I think it's a wonderful idea to explore. Uh, I'll be very happy to collaborate on any of the ideas. Uh, but yeah, there is no Gujarat model in our festival. Uh, we've been free of Gujarat model uh, and uh, we try to ensure that our literature and culture has a lot more. We try to bring it up. By the way, we curate a festival which is largely around Gujarati language, uh, but it is not limited to Gujarati. We have English, Hindi and a lot of other languages, including Malayali, which is one of the larger languages in Ahmedabad. So that's the format we have. Th thanks, Sham. I'm going to come back to you on the language issue. Um, Anna, and I'm going to come back to you with some of what Sham said. Nas Natasha, you got cut off in, in the earlier thing, your signal dropped. So finish what you were saying, but also if you can address something that you talked about, how literature, Sri Lanka has used literature in many ways to look at uh, coming to terms with what happened in the, in the genocide or war crimes, etc. We've seen that both in Rwanda and we've seen it in South Africa uh, with the Truth and Reconciliation Mission. And uh, more recently, the book that uh, uh, Mahmood wrote, uh, which looked at some of these issues, mapping what's happening in Israel and Palestine to what happened in South Africa. Uh, there's Mahmood Mabdani in his new book. But tell us how you've been able to address some of that. And of course, what we didn't hear you saying uh, because you got cut off. Sure. Um, so, in Columbus Scope, um, our I would put that forward that, you know, uh, my expertise is much more in, in the visual arts, even though I also work as a writer and editor. Um, we have been working with a cross section of artists, but really also focusing on the younger generation of practitioners, um, many of whom you know, have lived through uh, the, the time of war. Uh, we're also, though, very kind of convinced that because there have been these disruptions, uh, geopolitical disruptions within the cultural continuity, uh, you know, what is it that we can do to create? much more of a, a, a kind of a resonance because Sri Lanka in that sense uh, a history, has a history of being also isolated from that international creative dialogue and the possibilities that it offers. So we're very careful to um, not sort of uh, you know, create a sort of singular narrative uh, of this time uh, of uh, war, uh, but rather really to think about collective histories, the kind of minor histories uh, that are resurfacing and through the artist's vision, sort of moving into the field of memory uh, and uh, experiences of belonging as well as displacement. So our upcoming edition and that we've been working on really as an umbrella for the last two years <clears throat> is called Language is Migrant. So it really thinks about aspects of language and migrancy uh, you know, which connect us to the reality of Sri Lanka with so much of the community that has been displaced and that are part of the world diaspora. Uh, so this is how, you know, we, we have been thinking and Language is Migrant is a brilliant poem manifesto by Cecilia Vicuña, a Chilean artist poet, 
so my my role sort of is also to think about how a festival that need not be a literature festival how can it still use um the conditions of language uh, to kind of build a, a greater dialogue with history uh and at the same time you know i just wanted to mention with uh, what sham was saying i think venues play a huge role uh, because every bit of our built architecture tells a story of the recent past and the present uh so we're also thinking very much about how we use uh the public sites in colombo for this freely accessible festival uh and some of these buildings particularly have been through uh have been ravaged also through the time of war or have been beautified in the post war reality um and so these are ways in which we can also narrate spatially uh the kind of community uh histories of uh the island uh that was fascinating the bit about built uh, architecture and i'll come back to you uh, and a migrant language i mean europe today is really being uh seeing the upheaval due to migration and many countries be it hungary or otherwise are looking at how to push back against uh, this kind of migration how do you see this playing a role and you know taking also when you talked about the issues around environment when you talked about issues around inequity can you tell us how do you see that being reflected in the programming that you've been doing uh in in portugal as well uh yes uh, our our festival is also very concerned with um migration and uh, for instance we 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 are uh, hosting and receiving people coming from uh syria from other country iran and so on but i think this is um, a, a major problem and uh, i'm writing now finishing a book about africa because i think that the western world has a, a great debt to africa so we we explored everything that was possible in africa especially human beings we are continuing to explore everything we can in africa and they are still one of the poorest people on earth they don't have in this moment they have more poverty they don't have vaccination they don't have anything they don't have water so i think the literature should be also engaged and committed to uh, uh make awareness of for these problems and i think that uh, of course migrants we have a lot of migrants from africa morocco uh from everywhere but africa is a continent that we should look very very carefully and if the economical powers or the political uh, powers don't look to africa as they should so let's culture look to africa as we must and as a writer this is my priority because we of course if they flee from their own countries because they don't have the minimal conditions to survive there they come to us because they have the hope to be welcomed here but the problem is not welcome them the problem is to make in their countries the real conditions to live there because no one wants or likes to be a foreigner in another country i love to be a portuguese in portugal yes and we are also a country of migrants we we migrated everywhere so what we need really is to have um a pattern of development for africa forgetting our selfishness and our selfish economical interests because still now africa is the hope of our planet still now we are stealing everything they have there and leave them in the in the outrageous misery so europe 
can have a very, very important role in this, uh, in this issue. And I think that is the minimum we should do after centuries and centuries of exploitation of this continent. And so as artists, as a writer, as cultural promoters, I think that this should be an issue to uh, globalize and to, and to edify the literary festivals and the cultural festivals or art festivals in general. Totally perfectly said, uh, Anna. I think Europe has been at best rapacious uh, when it comes to Africa. Uh, and most of the imperialistic traditions that have done the most horrific deeds across the length and breadth of Africa, they've never thought that it's important to give back. Sham, coming to you, taking from what Anna talked about, you know, migration, it was fascinating to hear that how many Malayalis, which is all the way Malayalam is, is a language spoken all the way down south of India, have traveled up to, uh, to Ahmedabad. And that's, you know, again, uh, att the attraction is industry. As opposed to, say, in every village in UP, every village in Bihar, every village across the country, us creating opportunities for jobs, for equity, for education, and for health, but it doesn't exist. But as this has happened, and in many ways, you know, the Malayalis have a completely different culture uh, from Gujarat. The language, uh, uh, the phonetics, everything is different. How has that impacted society uh, in Gujarat? And therefore, how has that impacted your festival, which you're saying is primarily a Gujarati festival with, uh, with a Malayali uh, angle to it? Fascinating. You're on mute, Shyam. Sorry. Thank you for asking this question. Uh, this is one of the very interesting aspects of Ahmedabad that uh, people know about. Uh, we're not just the city of entrepreneurs, but we are also a city of people who make the enterprises successful. And they have come from all over the country, uh, right from Rajasthan to Punjab, Bengal, uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and so on. Uh, so for uh, multiple historic reasons, right from the time of textile industries, uh, the heydays of textile industry, we had uh, a lot of migrants coming from Kerala. They've been here for now three or four generations. And so many of them never participate in the Malayali programs we do, which is one of my biggest complaints, but they're very happy to participate in the Gujarati events. So that's been the change. They've accepted Gujarati as uh, their primary language. They don't read things in, uh, you know, we can't call it their mother tongue, but their family's uh, original language, they're not connected with them. And that's the pattern I have seen amongst all the migrants who have come and lived in Ahmedabad. They've been here for a very long time. Uh, it's not that new migration is not happening, but the traditional pools of migrants from different places have amalgamated so well in Gujarati society that our original idea of having multiple language programs have not really uh, worked as, as well as we would have wanted them uh, in a nice way because they are very happy to sit through in the Gujarati events and accept that language as their own. So that's been my uh, primary experience that Gujarati has nicely and organically grown into a language accepted by everybody. Fascinating. Uh, Nilofar, two questions to you, taking from what again Shyam and Anna said. Uh, you know, Kasoli uh, as a destination, which is where your festival originated, uh, borders two different states, Haryana and Punjab. In fact, it is the sort of uh, hill capital of the Punjab as much. Has that impacted the programming that you do in Kasoli? And the second question again, something that Natasha talked about is, uh, destination, location, architecture. Kasoli, again, the hill station, is a particular place. What got you uh, and Rahul, why did you decide to set this up in Kasoli? I remember our initial conversations when you were planning to set it up there, but what was it? What was the driving factor? And Elifa, you're on uh, mute. 
sorry again. Uh, yes, the, the main reason we chose Kasoli is because uh, that was a place where Kushwan Singh had a home. So, uh, sorry, not... Nilufa, you, if you just move back a bit because we're getting only your... Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Kushwan Singh did a lot of his writing in Kasoli. It was a place he loved. And uh, that's how the festival started in Kasoli. And it was the same with London. You know, London was a place where he went to university. He worked there. We were invited to come to London. So uh, both these places have strong associations with Pushwan Singh. And uh, uh, our festival, um, yes, uh, is very much uh, we incorporate a lot of the Punjab because our main audience uh, really is from the Punjab, Delhi, North India. So we have uh, people coming from all over the country and, and um, even uh, strangely from other parts of the world. Uh, we had, a, a, I remember at our first festival, there was a German lady holidaying in Pasoli and she just happened to uh, wander into the festival and decided to um, come back every year. So um, uh, the content of the festival Punjab is very much a part of our festival content in Kasoli because uh, uh, it was very much a part of Pushwan Singh's writings too. I mean, he's written uh, the most authoritative history of the Sikhs. Um, uh, so Himachal, and then uh, Himachal too, because that's the state we have the festival in. So we have a lot of Himachal content, um, archaeology, art. It's uh, these were all his areas of interest. So every festival has, uh, uh, you know, we had, uh, in fact, the London festival, which uh, just finished last month, we had. Uh, William uh, Dalrymple and uh, Vidya Dahaja speaking on Vidya's new book, uh, So India and a Hundred Objects. So uh, it's uh, it's an important part of our, uh, very much so. Um, Kanak, you know, Lucknow and UP and many parts of it are sort of known for its Ganga Jamuna Tehzeeb or the syncretic traditions that we see in India uh, between religions, between communities, between people. Based in Lucknow and even part of your Kanpur program, is that reflected? Is there a pushback today in terms of how you can present uh, the art, culture and heritage of the people? Uh, you know, is there a pushback by majoritism? Is, is that a threat? To the future of any festival? Yeah, um, sadly so it is. Lucknow for one has never had any religious ride in its history, but uh, the social fabric is damaged quite a bit in the last few years. Now people of different faiths are not very comfortable speaking about their situation or the current situation in the country, though uh, we take pride in um, living in the, you know, Doaba region, which is used to be the food bowl. It used to be um, a melting pot of so many religions. We've always accepted people from all over the world, but that 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 social fabric is damaged, and so is the social fabric of the rural places. So we intend to do a rural festival this year, sometime in winters. And we want to begin with the folk songs and folk tales because surprisingly, uh, the social fabric in rural areas is still quite intact. You know, there's a, there's a caste system, there's a religious boundary, and yet uh, at the end of the day, most people would get together and sit together, you know, uh, exchange ideas, exchange their days, journey, whatever. Whereas in cities, um, when it comes to curating a festival and we want to do something which is not politically correct, we really look forward to look towards our bureaucratic friends who would tell us how to go about it because we are a festival that depends on the state government. So we, uh, like that song from Notting Hill, 
you say it best when you say nothing at all so that's what we do we try and package the so called unnationalistic things in a way that uh, they are palatable to the powers that be uh that 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 change is very much perceptible in the last uh, now this is our ninth year so when we began it was not much of uh, a challenge but it is very much a challenge and we depend heavily on the state government sponsorship uh, so can the other follow up question is you know if you looked at the past you looked at the great universities or the great high courts or the centers of justice in india look at allahabad uh, you look of course at the writing that came out of up out of calcutta out of out of you know madras presidency but up in many ways was the heartland of thought and thinking it's where the uh, the national the independence movement gained traction that was the home to so many uh, prime ministers it was the place of intellectual pursuit i mean delhi only followed you know in the last maybe three decades or four decades delhi uh, sort of became the capital of that so what happened i mean do you see an erosion in um, in the kind of writing i mean or are they many undiscovered arvind krishna mehrotra's sort of hiding uh, in the pages of poetry which someday will be revealed That, that's absolutely right now for instance how many nobel prizes in literature has india won i uh, there, there are two things about it one is the social structure what is happening to the social and political climate mm-hmm. of the country and the second thing is um r- writing in your own language i think that makes a lot of difference when you are thinking in some other language and you are writing in a different language it makes all the difference how many people have won any nobel prize in any of the streams from india so we need to look at it um, quite seriously as to do we still want to have english as our medium of teaching because i uh, am connected with a lot of rural rural children who are very sharp and intelligent but till class 7th or 8th they cannot compete anywhere with the urban children because the language is a barrier so that is one thing the second thing as you said about political scenario i think we don't have um, we only have technocrats at best we don't have statesmen anymore i think it goes for all of our country sad though it may sound so up and lucknow are no better and, and right and, and, yes sure and i'm coming to you in the politics of language is obviously uh, you know it's a politics of identity it's a politics of place it's a politics of home and as you say now it's the politics of migration as well and as new languages come in uh, in our mind and we've seen this across the world over while there's always resistance from the majority about anybody foreign you know coming in a different language a different culture a different uh, a different tradition you've seen how it enriches languages if you look at the english language today uh, or if you look at many even turkish there's over uh, 1300 words from hindi uh, you know one of our national languages in turkey for example english words are pretty much part of the hindi or across the idiom today across india's 27 or 29 national languages and yet in europe uh, whether it's france or spain or portugal or hungary or, or belgium or, or the flemish speaking people who will not uh, you know work with the with the other lot the politics of language have become really complex do you see the sharing of words of ideas of thoughts which cross language cross the language barrier do you see that as the potential of, you know going back to your idea can we have one one earth festival or a earth literary festival do you see that as a possibility or or language would you always see that as a divide in india today for example we have language wars between the south and the north between the northeast Uh, and and the north between you know the center of india and the rest of it 
So it's it's very complicated. <laughs> yes, I, I I see the language primarily as a mean of communication. And as a mean of communication, I think language has no barrier, has no frontiers, has no limits. If we think about the Portuguese since our uh, origin, we had so many changes. We have uh, Portuguese words in Turkish. We have Portuguese words in, in, in in Romanian, we have Portuguese. So uh, our base is, is Latin. So uh, I think that language should change as we need it. If we need to change the language, we will, we should. Even if the intellectuals don't do, people, the, the people will do it. And now we have a very, important discussion about Portuguese because Portuguese is spoken in, in several countries uh, like Brazil, like uh, so. And uh, uh, we were trying to make uh, um, a kind of uh, standard Portuguese for all the countries in Africa, for all the countries that uh, are uh, Portuguese speakers. And a lot of um, voices raised against this because they defended the purity of the language. I don't. I don't defend the purity of language. I defend the possibility of communicating, enriching our dialogue in, the, in all the possible ways. And of course we have words also from, Fre from, from French, from, from English, from, and if English, is the language that allows us to understand each other all, I don't have any prejudices against that. But as our great poet said, my language is, uh, my country is my language. Of course, we have to preserve our language, but not to close it, not to put it in, in a, in a uh, in a place where is untouchable, where is completely uh, out of the reality. So language is a living being, is probably the most living being we have because it allowed us to um, evolve, allowed us to create all the civilization we have and Maybe we will have in the future. And I, I was um, seeing a very interesting documentary about uh, uh, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, intelligence. And they were say, saying that maybe the language will be the space where we, we can be 100% autonomous. And that this new kind of intelligence cannot um, damage. I'm going to so, come, I'm, I'm going to go to Sham and ask him about can language be 100% autonomous? But before that, Natasha, you know, Anna talked about language crossing every barrier. The visual arts, the language of the visual arts or the arts also crosses every barrier. And because it was Guernica, crossed every barrier, it, it uh, presented uh, the war in its most horrific way uh, uh, during uh, Franco's time. So tell us how you've been able to use that. I mean, you work again in two completely different realities, right? Dubai, which is a fairly comparatively closed uh, reality, Sri Lanka, which has got now a new reality from what you had even a year ago. Uh, and hopefully quite different from what you had before. How do you see that sort of making that bridge? How does visual arts as a language bridge the gap? So I'm, I'm actually based between Berlin and Sri Lanka and my recent um, position has included being the co-artistic director of the Guangzhou Biennale, which is the oldest uh, contemporary art biennale uh, in Asia. And so within you know, these kind of cultural ecosystems of South Korea or Berlin, 
uh, obviously the state uh, also leads uh, artistic uh, and cultural uh, infrastructure and activities in a completely uh, different level uh, and yet you know i'm sort of in between these worlds uh, also thinking about uh, what it means to sort of sustain uh, this momentum of uh, creative thinking and free expression uh, from uh, anchored in, in Sri Lanka as well. And like you say, you know, uh, we work with, for instance, artists uh, who are thinking about oral cultures as well, uh, the way that Kanak was uh, talking also about the sonic, whether that is the folk song or for instance, you know, we've been uh, working on uh, creating a multilingual uh, series uh, of online uh, radio-based programming, you know, and uh, it's called A Thousand Channels. Also drawing from Edouard Glissant's One Way Ashore, A Thousand Channels. Now, what are these ways of thinking about the tributaries and not only the main course of, of the river? Um, we've been looking at um, the kinds of uh, forms of poetics and the relationship of poetry to visual arts practice. Uh, we're going to create a reading room with artist-made zines and artist books, uh, which is called Reading in Tongues, drawing from Gloria Anzaldua's work, uh, you know, and the tongue as this stubborn place uh, that learns language sometimes uh, in ways, you know, that is also breaking language at the same time, that is mutating uh, the forms of words and opening up words. You know, so these are the ways in which we feel that uh, it is not about simply published mainstream literature, but actually with uh, interdisciplinary art forms, we can actually approach that question of language and migration in really important ways in the present. Reading, reading in tongues, that's, that was fabulous. Asham, can language be autonomous? And how do you work get around some of the issues that you have, you're on mute. You're on mute. One of the major uh, reasons of our starting, our starting the festival was a bit of rebellion against uh, the, uh, you know, the compulsions or the purity or the orthodoxy uh, in language, which had seeped in a lot in Gujarati culture, in Gujarati literature and generally in society. Uh, we try to uh, fight it back and we believe that the language has to be what people choose it to be. It has to have influences coming constantly. It has to evolve constantly. And like Anna said, it is a very living being. Uh, you cannot bind it and you cannot define, predefine and continue to impose those definitions. Because if I have to read the uh, ancient Gujarati text, the forget the ancient, even the uh, two centuries old text, it'll be very difficult for me to understand, uh, even for today's generation. So uh, the whole debate about purity of language, I think uh, it's, it's a dead debate. Uh, there is nothing like pure language. In fact, we held a couple of sessions on this. That, uh, you know, where are the influences on uh, different words and uh, stuff that we use in Gujarati come from? And we were surprised to see it from all over the world, over the centuries. It is impossible for anybody to limit it to either Sanskritic influence or, uh, you know, Prakrit or Turkish or Arabic. It comes from all over. And I think pretty much that's the case with all the languages. European languages will see now with new pattern of migration, words coming from the Eastern Europe and Africa and so on. So this change is going to be constant and is going to increase with globalization. So I guess uh, this is going to be a very important uh, aspect in how we deal with languages and literature. Uh, Nilofa Sham talked about and Anna talked about the living language, language being living. Um, you know, in Punjab, for example, whether it's the Ragi in the Gurdwara uh, or of course the Himachal folk traditions, uh, that recount the story, story after story of great battles, of great success, of love, of betrayal. Do you see that as one of the primary purposes of festivals which are anchored in a particular geography? Nilofa, you're on mute. And you'll have to just move back a bit. 
um, yes, it is. Uh, it, it, it is important to festivals that are anchored in the region uh, to take up issues and uh, uh, to take up the art culture of the region and uh, issues of the region. We have uh, uh, we have uh, done that to a certain extent. But if you uh, look at language, we've often been asked, you know, that, um, uh, why don't you do a session in Punjabi? I mean, we've, we've done sessions in Hindi. But uh, uh, what we keep saying is that, uh, you know, uh, our strength is English. English is, we consider, in fact, Pushan Singh put peace. Uh, saying English is my mother tongue. I mean, he may speak Punjabi, he may speak Hindi. Um, so our familiarity is with English, and uh, uh, that is really the language of the festival. But being anchored in that region, yes, there's a lot of Punjabi, there's a lot of Hindi that comes into the uh, sessions organically. And, and I think uh, that's part of the charm of the festival. In fact, we had, uh, in the early years, we used to invite uh, large numbers of Pakistanis across to Kasoli because uh, Indo-Pakistan ties was something that Pushwan Singh was very keen on. And uh, they would lapse into Punjabi and Hindi. It was wonderful, you know, hearing people from across the border speak your language. Um, uh, so that was the charm. Of course, in later years, uh, uh, we were forbidden from uh, getting any Pakistanis in. We, we had to, in fact, uninvite uh, a delegation of Pakistanis that we had invited to the festival. And uh, hopefully the digital festival will give us a chance to have them back on air again. A kind of oral traditions, again, uh, you know, Uttar Pradesh, whether it's the Dastangwe or the Musharas and the Mehfils, these are performing poets way before performing poetry became fashionable or came into season. And, and yet we don't see these to be mainstream in the elegant soirees of, uh, of, of uh, metro life. These are still, though they attract tens of thousands of people, they still seem to be uh, vernacular, sort of somewhere not quite mainstream. Why? Uh, well, um, our festival metaphor began from these uh, small home readings that we used to call Bethaks. And in Lucknow, we still have these nashists for Urdu and um, some poetry for uh, Hindi, Sahitya. It has always been a home to Hindi, Sahitya and Urdu. So um, uh, whereas we do have Mushairas, that was pre-COVID, um, especially during winters, we'll have about five to seven sittings of major poets and shires coming from all over the world and uh, holding these mushairas, it will be very well attended in thousands by thousands of people. But uh, post COVID things have changed and English is one language that is yet to go global whereas Lucknow is concerned. So there was this lull once uh, Amritlal Nagar and uh, Varmaji passed away, there was this Yashpal when they passed away, there was this lull between the, for, in the literature world. That is why the literature festival became popular. And we do have many book cafes sprouting, I think, post-literature festival, wherein the youngsters go and spend some time with books and coffee. So, uh, yeah, the swari is uh, not as many as we would like to see. But Hindi and English, especially the Naivali Hindi, is very much in vogue. And uh, to be fair to them, they may not be as serious uh, writers as you would like to see. But the, but the change is perceptible. We can see that youngsters have joined in. A lot of volunteers just walk in and say, we want to work for the festival. So uh, I, I'm quite happy with this change, which has come in the last decade or so. That's, that's, that's wonderful. We're going to have to end. I'm going to ask Anna 
uh, for a closing comment. Anna, 7.5 billion people on the earth headed towards 8 billion. 8 billion voices, 8 billion ideas, 8 billion people who want their voice to be heard. One of the things we've been saying is that every city, town, village, everybody needs a platform, a festival where they can present their word, they can present their thoughts, their ideas. That's what enriches us. Uh, tell us, how do you see the future? Um, you know, uh, of course, uh, the internet and the digital festivals are really very, very powerful and very interesting. But um, I have to say that nothing replaces uh, the meeting and uh, uh, when we can be together, when we can uh, share ideas together, when we can uh, share affections and emotions. And uh, this is, of course, a contradiction uh, between uh, 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 of what I said in the beginning. But I think that we, we, we maybe need to explore ways to reach people physically. Let's think how we traveled, how we met people when we didn't have planes or when we didn't have uh, uh, this so uh, quickly means of transportation. Let's think if we can go back to those times and uh, have another concept of time. Why are we always in this so wild hurry? What are we persecuting? What do we want? Why do we want to, to get to a place so quickly? We were thinking in our festival to invite people here who could come in a, a rail train, uh, in, a, in, a, in a train, maybe uh, for five, six days, and enjoying the time they have during the trip, being inspired by everything they live and experience during the trip to come to the festival. And in a way, I think this should be the challenge for uh, our festivals. Try to reach people. Of course, digital is a very important mean and we should continue to use it, but uh, nothing replaces being present. Nothing why are we such, why, as you said, why are we in such a hurry? What are we searching for? Uh, yeah, I think all of us are, are searching we, for. What are we searching? Totally. I think these are some of the issues that we need to continue to debate and discuss, and we'll do so in our series in our director's fortnight conversations at the Jaipur Bookmark. Anna Philomona, Amarel, uh, Kana Krekha Chauhan, Natasha Jinwala, Nilofa Bilumoria, Sham Parekh, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Uh, I you. wish we were doing it in person. It's much easier to exchange ideas. Yes. Uh, we have to figure out how to do it in a safe, yes. Yes. environmentally safe way yes. beyond a particular point. Zoom has its limitations. Uh, Suraj, over to you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Anjoy. Thank you, thank you Anna, Kanna, Natasha, Nilipa, and you. Sham for this splendid session. It was really fascinating to hear your thoughts on what the current market scenario is. How do you see it moving forward and what all we are dealing with at the moment? And thank you, Sanjoy, for knitting the conversation so wonderfully. And thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and will join us for another such roundtables where directors from around the world will join us to discuss and share their views on similar topics. Till then, keep safe, take care of yourself and see you soon.
in these times uh, during covid when we're all sitting at home it's it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together it certainly brightens up my evenings aaj pandemic mein hum digitally the literature festival kar rahe hain aur mujhe lagta hai ki hamare samne shrota nahi hai hum aapas mein baat kar rahe hain lekin us feel ko us mang ko mehsoos kar sakte hain ki hazaron lakho log humse jude hue hain humko sun rahe hain aur kahin na kahin koi sarthak hastakshep ho raha hai people who came online to view and listen to our incredible speakers from across the world we were able to continue in our tradition of ensuring the free flow of knowledge and information